the rest of the story. For those who were in their teens, when our century was also in its teens, there was a hero, the piano man, a gifted musician. His stage was the big city music shop or the music department of a department store. His playing attracted customers, but there was more to his magic than that. He could play on demand any sheet music in the store. Old arrangements and new, perfect the first time through. To wide-eyed youngsters, his skill was artistry, and so the dream was perpetuated. Maybe someday I'll be a piano man, too. One of those eager young listeners was Ray. At 14, at 14, Ray was already a competent pianist. His mother, a piano teacher, had guided him through the early discipline, technical study, classical repertoire. And yet for Ray, at 14, there was really only one dream, to become a piano man, like the ones he'd seen at Woolworth and Kresge in downtown Chicago. The summer after his freshman year in high school, Ray was determined to make his dream come true. One way or another, he was going to make money playing the piano. By the age of 17, he had dropped out of high school, was taking piano jobs as they came, played with a band at Paul Paul Lake in Michigan. And then there was a dime dance pavilion called the Edgewater. Ray even played rinky-dink in a bordello until he found out what was going on upstairs. And then when the teenage piano man was about to emerge from his teens, he had a job as a music director for a suburban Chicago radio station, WGES, and he played piano, and he arranged music and accompanied singers and hired musicians. He hired musicians. One evening, two fellows came into the radio station. Their names were Sam and Henry. They sang and told jokes. Would Ray give them a job? Their singing was terrible, said Ray, but their jokes were amusing. He hired them for $5 apiece, wondering almost immediately thereafter why he had done so. Well, time showed him why. For while Sam and Henry were nobodies in 1922, while they had no experience and less professional polish, they did possess that little something that makes the big difference, the indiscernible spark of genius. Sam and Henry eventually made it big, and in the wake of their success, Ray, the young music director who had instinctively recognized their potential, realized his greater ability. Without that special star quality, the most Ray could have for himself was to be a middle and piano man. What Ray had going for him was the special ability to recognize talent in others. You see, Sam and Henry, the two raw recruits Ray recruited into radio, rearranged and refined their act eventually to become legendary. But it was Ray, the young musician, the teenager destined to obscurity as a piano man, who, recognizing talent in the raw, launched two unknown entertainers on their way to stardom. And later in 1954, with that same uncanny ability, recognized something special about a couple of California brothers named MacDonald making hamburgers. He also made their names more famous than his own. His own name was Ray Kroc, the discoverer of Amos and Andy, the godfather of McDonald hamburgers. And now you know the rest of the